thank you everyone for joining us tonight for our panel discussion after the screening of Facing Suicide. I'm Linda Stansberry. I am a local journalist and documentary filmmaker. And I'm so pleased tonight to be able to present a panel of uh, local experts and people with lived experience on the topic of suicide. I'm going to very quickly give an introduction to each of our panelists, and then we'll go on to questions. So uh, first of all, we have Alex Childers. Alex is a mental health advocate. They are currently a Sorrel Leaf Healing Center board member and Humboldt County Transition Age Youth Advocacy Board member and Alternatives to Suicide Peer Support Group Facilitator. So, so glad you could join us, Alex. We also have Rob England. Rob is a member of the Yurok Tribe who serves as a Tribal Public Health Director for United Indian Health Services in Arcata, California. In 2021, Rob received a National Impact Award through the National Indian Health Board for his work in healthcare and suicide prevention. We also have Leah Nagy. Leah is the president of NAMI Humble, who works closely with the county and leads, leads several support groups for families uh, who are dealing with mental illness and suicide in their families. Stan Collins is our friend from San Diego. Stan is a consultant in the field of suicide prevention, focusing on technical assistance and creation and implementation of suicide prevention curricula and strategies. And finally, last but not least, we have Simone Whipple. She's a parent and member of NAMI Humboldt. We also have Gardner Carlson, a local parent who has been affected by suicide and another member and board member of NAMI Humboldt. So welcome everyone. I'm so glad um, that we could be here. And I will open it up really quickly to um, our staff over at Keith and see if we have any questions on the line before we begin. Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna start uh, first with you, Stan. I'd like to know a little bit more since we are currently building up our capacity in Humboldt County for suicide prevention me uh, measures about your own experience as an activist and consultant in this field. Um, yeah, thank you, Linda. So I've worked in suicide prevention for about 20 years now. I lost a friend to suicide when I was in high school and it sent me down this path. Um, uh, a lot of the work that I do is working with communities. I do a lot of work in the school setting, but also at the community level, looking at how do we move forward with suicide prevention, understanding that for us to prevent suicide, it's not just prevention, it's how do we respond in the intervention phase, um, and also how do we respond after suicide, um, to be prepared ahead of time um, as a community um, so that we know how to provide those supports to individuals who have lost somebody. So as a loss survivor, obviously I have a big passion for that, but one of the things I really try to emphasize is while it's really important to have these systems in place, how do we get the average person, the average family member or friend uh, to understand the role that they can play? That it's not just recognizing warning signs, it's being able to, what I refer to as sit in the mud with somebody when they're searching for their hope again. So that's a lot of the work that I do. Thank you so much, Stan. And um, building off of that, Rob, you have such a wide breadth of experience on this topic in Humboldt County. I, I think if I remember correctly, 21 years of experience. And that is my experience working in the tribal community. And as a Yurok tribal member, that's just the, the focus that I've chosen as a career path. And can you tell me a little bit about what you've seen in our community, specifically here in Humboldt County over the course of your career in terms of the services available and maybe uh, the, the changing attitudes uh, towards the topic of suicide and mental health? I would say just overall, suicide prevention as a field itself is really young. And I think we've made quite a few strides in recent years. And some of the examples that I share is during high school, I would never be in the city of Eureka and see a city bus that may have the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline or the Suicide Crisis Line 
um, you know, the 988. And so I think we're, we're making progress as far as when it comes to mental health, but I also know that we have so much further to go. And I mentioned a three digit, you know, a crisis line, which just became a reality in July of this year. And for me, it's like, why did it take to 2022 to make this a reality? But I'm very happy that it's here. So I, I do believe that there are some conversations that are happening now within our community that previously weren't there, which um, is needed. And I also believe the, the field of lived experience and outside of just academia, when it comes to suicide prevention is needed. And I think that's why the, the breadth of this panel here tonight is so important because they are the ones that are in the mud, right? As we were saying, and of current realities of perhaps not accessing service, uh, services or being stuck and, and not really being able to get to where you need to go. And some of the things that I do share is that I think there's never going to be enough providers, right, to provide the services that we need at those times. And to me, that's why it's literally a public health issue. And so I believe that we need to do a better job about training the average person. And even though I've spent some time in this field, I am not a clinician. So I'm not a therapist. But I have, through my own personal loss of suicide within my, my family, within my community, have gravitated towards it. And my motivation is, is that I don't want other families to experience what my family went through. And so for me, that's my motivation in this field and doing what I can to improve our systems. And I thankfully have got the opportunity through my current work to do such a thing. And I got into suicide prevention about two years after losing my aunt to suicide. And I got to work under a suicide prevention project. And I would say the timing of two years was probably necessary for my own personal healing. And I got to provide trainings to our community to educate. And then I, and then as far as being able to lead a project. And some of that is looking and examining at our systems when it comes to screenings, overall trainings. I have a healthcare setting now that I'm in um, and, and trying to stress uh, some of those screenings that could happen. But one of the things that I'm super proud of is at our clinic, if you're a new hire at United Indian Health Services, everyone goes through a basic question, persuade, refer, suicide prevention training. And I'm really proud of that because it's a public health issue. And so all of the new hires in the last five years have went through that. And so just to do my little part that I can to hopefully provide for a healthier, healthier community. Thank you, Rob. And I want to pivot back to you in a few to uh go into that a little further. We do have a question from our audience. Laura asks, how on earth do we destigmatize any mental health or brain disorder issues? It feels like it never changes. So on the topic of destigmatization, um, Leah, maybe this is something that you want to start out with. Oh, yes, indeed. It's one of my things I'm real interested in. Um, I have heard that really stigma and discrimination is reduced when someone you know or care about develops a mental illness. So when you have lived experience of someone with mental illness, you do look at homeless people differently. You do know that mental illness is a chemical biological brain disorder and it's nobody's fault, but it takes a lot of education talking about it you know for years we had this in the closet nobody mentioned that my grandmother was mentally ill until my own son developed mental illness so 
I think talking about it now, not being afraid to, um, you know, engage people. It's interesting when I um, meet somebody and I say, well, yeah, I have several family members with mental illness. Sometimes that opens Pandora's box and they just talk and talk and wow, I felt so alone and now I don't feel so alone. Then the other component is all the famous um, people in the media and in the uh, film industry that do have mental illness and come out and talk about it. Glenn Close uh, did a great uh, interview and she started out by saying, I have a mental illness. And then she stopped and then she said in my family. So just adding that one section uh, kind of changed people's view. But, um, you know, no one is, um, everyone could get mental illness, you know, you could, you could like Christopher Reeves fall off a horse and, and have traumatic, a traumatic brain injury. So it's one in four people, one in five people. And I just think the more we can, um, we can knock down stigma. NAMI has a website called Stigma Busters. So in Valentine's Day, when they had a teddy bear in a straight jacket, I'm crazy about you. NAMI Stigma Busters got on that and, and they pulled that off the market. There was a restaurant in um, Eureka that had, I think, a bipolar pancake or something on the menu. And, and NAMI Humble, you know, went after that. There was an ad for an automobile with a nurse chasing somebody with a, I didn't see it, but with a hypodermic. And NAMI, I think, I don't know if it was Ford, I can't remember. But anyway, NAMI Stigma Busters got after that. So, and I think we can each do our own part. When we see something that bothers us, that, you know, is somebody being cruel to somebody else, if you don't feel like approaching the person, you know, maybe you can um, at least offer comfort to the person being victimized. You know, I, you see it every once in a while and it's sad, but. Anyway, like I said, boy, when it hits close to your home, I think Gardner and Simone would agree that you just view you just view the world so differently th than you did before, you know. So anyway, that's that's my that's my little soapbox, and I'm staying on it. I I think that's so true, and I have been working on my my own language. Um, you know, it's been pointed out that using the terms saying something is crazy along those lines. You know, this is ableist language, so I'm I'm always uh, looking at that and trying to change that a little bit. Uh, Stan has something to add. Um, yeah, well, I think especially just given the topic that you know the the central theme of suicide, I think it's also for us to, in addition to destigmatizing mental health and mental illness, understanding that not all suicides are related to mental illness. We used to say that 80 to 90% of people who contemplated suicide had a mental illness. And the CDC came out with a report that actually said probably less than 50%. And I think there, when it comes to suicide, I think there's a philosophical element that we need to address. I think every one of us goes through periods in time where what is our purpose? Why are we here? You know, when it comes to suicide, I think you can really simplify it down to pain and hope. And suicide happens when pain outweighs hope. And any of us can have life stack on top of us and, and run out of that hope or be in that overwhelming pain. Because um, I think if we oversimplify suicide and say, well, we just need to fix mental health and mental illness, uh, then we're never really going to get to the heart of the issue. And of course, some people who are having thoughts of suicide are dealing with a mental health issue or, or mental illness specifically. Um, but I think kind of going back to this idea of how can friends and family engage? Yeah, sometimes it is supporting someone as they're dealing with uh, and, and living with the mental illness, but sometimes it's also uh, just understanding what is it that is bringing them that emotional pain? What is it if they can't, you know, it's not about convincing people not to die. It's about helping people find their reasons for living. And I think that um, while it's important to talk about mental illness, um, that it's not always if this, then that. There's many people who will deal with a mental health challenge who will not think about suicide. And there's many of those who will think about suicide that don't have a diagnosable mental illness. They've just lost their, their sight of hope. That's very true. Thank you, Stan. And Alex, uh, could I get you to chime in here real quick? Yeah, so building off of what Stan said, I think validation is a really powerful tool, validation and connection. Uh, because like Stan said, suicide 
isn't necessarily a cause of mental illness. It can be a symptom, like depression can be a symptom of a struggle, but not necessarily the cause. And so in the support group that I run, a lot of us struggle with like being affected by racism, being affected by houselessness, being affected by disability. There's a lot of really big overwhelming factors that can lead to someone struggling. Um, but I'm a transition age youth and my peers, other young people do a really good job of just talking about it, saying, you know what, like I'm sick of being oppressed. I'm sick of feeling sick. Um, I'm feeling a lot of anxiety today. I'm going to step out and being able to be vulnerable in that way and share our stories with each other. It's really powerful in breaking down the stigma and allowing us to open up about what we're going through. I, I think that's so important. And I want to go back really quickly. Um, Leah, you mentioned that when someone has a family member who's been affected by suicide or mental illness, it does impact their perspective on things in a way it may not have before. So I want to ask um, Simone or Gardner, whichever one of you uh, cares to chime in, uh, you've had some lived experience on this topic. Did it change how you perceive the world? I guess I'll start with Simone. I'm trying to unmute, there we go. Um, it took me, the, my experience, personally, most intimate experience with suicide was the father my, at my, we were separated at the time, um, but the father of my two daughters committed suicide and I was furious at him for years. It, it um, and it took me a long time and reading of, to realize he was just too sick because it affected his oldest daughter so much. And um, so I remember, and, and then studying Kuva Ross and the stages of grief, I just went to anger pretty much right away because of the effect it had on my girls. And you know, and now I, I know he was at the end of his rope and just really a very, very sad part of our family life, you know. So I think that was the main thing. And then realizing just how fragile we all are. We're incredibly um, resilient in so many ways and incredibly fragile at the same time. Thank you. Um, I want to go back real quick and tell you guys some of the things our audience members are saying. So we do have a, a live audience feed here. Um, Brenda Starr said that she lived in Arley in the late 70s in a teepee on the river. Arley was one of the towns featured in the PBS documentary. She said uh, the Film brought up a lot of feelings, especially recalling the gray long winters. I think most of us in Humboldt can relate to that. Uh, she also said it's a beautiful film and I would encourage anyone in our audience who or a panel who only saw the, the 30 minute clip to go and watch the whole thing. It is on PBS. Uh, Claire said, great effort by the NAMI stigma busters. Great things like, little things like that make a big difference. So some kudos for you guys. Trisha said, good points all. Not being able to find housing when poor made me feel like ending it all. Two family members died by suicide. Now I know how much pain they were in. And that, that's really rough. Um, I think it is, uh, this is a good place to talk about our unique community up here in Humboldt County and some of the specific challenges we're seeing. And I think this might be a good time to inter introduce our um, our ACEs scores. And maybe I'll, I'll lean back on uh, Leah to talk about that real quick about ACEs. Did you want me to talk about that, Linda, right quick? Is that what you said? Okay, I was kind of listening. Kinda... Yeah, so, um, you know, if someone, ACE scores is adverse childhood experiences and, um, all of you on the panel, I know, have heard that term. Um, it is a, a topic that's being talked about more and more. There's newspaper articles and there's a, a simple questionnaire. And if someone has four points 
um, up to four points, they have a 70, 37% increased risk of suicide later in life. So the, this traumatic stuff for kids um, is being recognized by Humboldt County Mental Health and by a lot of providers. It's called uh, trauma-informed care. Um, it's realizing that kids are so affected by the things that happen. Simone's children and other, you know, kids um, as well, you know, poverty, divorce, things that you may not even think is particularly uh, a point on the scoring is certainly um, a, a challenging. Uh, so I think we really need to focus on kids as an intervention and prevention. And in Australia, they view mental health as a team sport and they view mental health education as important as PE. Remember when we all had to take PE up through 12th grade in high school, I think. Well, in Australia, they use, they have in the curriculum mental health for kids. And I remember going to Fortuna High maybe four or five years ago, and I did a little thing on mental illness. And I never will forget this kid raised his hand and said, well, do they still do frontal lobotomies? And I was like, so just so blown away that the information that our young people have about mental health, mental, mental care, you know, mental illness, whatever, it's not talked about much. Sometimes not in the home maybe and not at school. So I think um, if I had my way as a former teacher of special ed in Redway, um, I would have, you know, every kid be exposed to mental health as a team sport and supporting each other and um, learning, uh, you know, PQR, whatever. Um, I mean, QPR, does it say PQR? QPR, <laughs> question per se, persuade and refer. Anyway, um, yeah, so A scores are certainly important. Uh, and when we look at our, our children and our youth and we need to have compassion for what these kids have been through, I think. So thanks, Linda, that was, that was a nice opportunity for me to talk about ACEs. Not the card. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, you know, on that topic, uh, Rob, United Indian Health Services and the Yurok Tribe have been doing some really amazing work specifically with youth. And I understand a lot of this is kind of your baby, if I'm not wrong. Uh, could you tell us a little more about that? Just one of the things I would like to share, and just as far as what Leah is saying and I would say in my dream world, as far as talking about our, our youth and our schools, is that I really believe that we should be taught coping skills throughout our education. And when you think of the time of you know kindergarten through 12th grade and so many things that could happen to us at that time, whether it's a loss of a grandparent, which people may have, and, and experiencing that grief and I think we need to practice. And are we gonna cope in a positive way with, in grief, or are we gonna take that bottle or that pill to numb that pain? And no matter who you are, you're gonna be faced with challenges throughout life, whether it's a, you know, failing a test or the loss of your first relationship. Life happens and life can be hard. And so I, I think that there's not enough emphasis on uh, positive coping skills throughout life. And so, you know, those are some of the things as far as upstream prevention efforts, I will say. Um, there's other things as far as, you know, interventions when things are happening. And then, you know, some of our postvention responses are some of those steps to prevention as well, because we know how much people are impacted with the trauma and loss of someone, especially if it's by suicide, because it's a loss like no other. Absolutely. So um, just going again really quickly to talking about um, youth services in Humboldt County. In the course of making the documentary, one of the things that we really came up against um, that uh, the parents I spoke to on, um, came up against was that we have a real lack of providers in uh, Humboldt County. And um, 
one of the uh, interviewees I spoke to when they were going through a mental health crisis, there was no place for them to go in Humboldt County. And I understand uh, that might be changing. So Alex, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about Sorrel Leaf Healing Center, what it is and how it came about and your work there. Yeah, definitely. So Sorrel Leaf Healing Center is going to be a crisis residential program for young people ages seven to 18 who are experiencing mental health crisis. Um, and this all came about because our executive director, Dr. Evan Buxbaum, he was seeing um, patients in his practice who were in crisis um, and these kids would go to the emergency room and then be waiting there for like two, three weeks to get treatment. Um, and then when they finally found a bed for them, they'd be sent out of the area with like no way to keep in contact with their community, or away from their parents. And that whole experience can be really traumatic for a young person. Um, he often tells a story and I witnessed similar things during my experiences where he had a patient who was having a breakdown and she was tackled and put into restraints and sedated. And when she came back, she said, like, what I really needed in that moment wasn't to be tackled. What I really needed a hug. That's huge. And that's what drove him to start working on this project. Um, so we're hoping to offer nine beds of crisis residential stays for 10 to 30 days for young people, and they'll have access to our property. Um, there's going to be a farm and art therapy and lots of healing modalities. Um, and our goal is really to help keep young people in our community um, with the people who are able to support them. And we're planning to have a three bed crisis stabilization as well for shorter term stays. That's exciting. So I, I know your uh, opening date has been uh, nudged a little bit. Do you have an idea when you guys will be opening your doors? Right now, we're looking at about a year and a half, but we're going to know more once we learn more about construction costs. Um, we have a bald eagle nest on the property, which is a beautiful thing. It's amazing. Um, it's wonderful. And also, it means that we can't do construction during certain times of the year. Um, so we will know more soon about what our timeline looks like. Excellent. And Alex, I, I hope you don't mind. I'm just going to pepper you with a few more questions. What have you seen locally in terms of gaps and services uh, for you specifically? I think the reality is that it just feels like there is absolutely nothing. Um, so for myself, when I was a teenager, um, I met with a school counselor and what she told me was that I had to go to our local crisis stabilization unit three times in order to be taken seriously and to be given inpatient treatment, uh, which is a pretty huge like gatekeeping barrier to getting care before reaching a point of crisis. Um, so I think there's sort of, as we all have talked about already, there's sort of a lack of prevention services to preventing someone from getting to a place of crisis in the first place. Um, I think there's a lack of youth specific services as well, because at our local crisis residential or our local crisis stabilization unit, um, I was like placed in the same, not in the same room as adults, but, you know, like right next to adults, which could be very scary. Um, so there's definitely a need there for more like youth specific services, and there's a need for more services that remain within Humboldt County. Thank you. We have a couple of questions, Alex, specifically on this topic. Uh, Claire asked, they would love to know how to get in touch with uh, folks about Sorrel Leaf. And then Simone also wants to know if this facility is gonna be open to other counties. Yeah, so if you wanna know more about Sorrel Leaf, you can get in touch at sorrelleaf.org. That is our website. Um, and I believe our email is info at sorrelleaf.org, um, but I would double check the website just to be sure. Um, the facility, it will be open to surrounding counties, um, but our goal is to serve youth in Humboldt County first. Thank you. So I'm going to go back quickly to, to Rob, and uh, I, we do have a comment here from an audience member who said coping skills should be a priority, and they wish that their son and they had had more as well. So we're talking a little bit about coping skills. And Rob, I wanted to ask you uh, specifically about your work uh, with tribal members. You've said the answers for tribal populations uh, reside within the communities uh, themselves. And I'd love to hear a little more about that. So we know our community systems that are in place and sometimes of lack of access. And I would say just from my own personal experience, 
is that when I was able to lead our suicide prevention project, we were in the midst of a suicide cluster in the community of Witchback. And if people are familiar with Witchback, uh, the little sign says 150, but community member said that there's 250 people, but there were seven suicides in a matter of 17 months, which is an extremely alarming number. And it wasn't until after the seventh suicide and there was a community member, and he was a pretty quiet man, but um, for lack of a better term, his son was the sixth suicide in the community at that time. And he had handcrafted a little half page message and collected signatures, you know, and begging the, the chairman, the vice chair, district representatives of the Yurok tribe and others to do something within the community. And, you know, in reflection, to me, it's heartbreaking that it took that long for there to be action. And some of that has to do with the silence of suicide and the stigma that some feel, but for, for all of that to happen. And I know that that really sparked and he was able to get 200 signatures in like a week and so in going door to door and so there was many community meetings and we were able to bring together our local Humboldt County services, Indian Health Services, people at SAMHSA which is the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration to the national level and we sat there and I remember being in that meeting and it was about an hour just to introduce ourselves, our titles, our roles within our community. And we were all at the table because we were in a full-blown uh, crisis in this small community. And it led to many community meetings and to really listen to the communities, we call it downriver. And, you know, there was moms that were saying, you know, in my community, there's not a playground for me to take my children. And something as simple as that, there was another gentleman that said, you know what, if, if you gave me a, a wrestling mat, I would coach a sports team here. And I was like, and I come from a wrestling background, which probably made me a little bit self-conscious. Um, but then I was like, you know what? I think I could do that. And I talked to my project officer and bought it. But what I think was extremely beautiful about it is it brought the community together. They had 26 kids, boys and girls, join that team. It brought what I say is many healthy male role models that were former wrestlers who had these mentoring and skills that they that they could bring to the youth in their community as far as families getting together. And the thing I think about is if they were, in essence, didn't have that sports team in their community, they would have to get to Hoopa to join the next closest team. And for some of those um, families in that community, that could be an hour there, an hour back, that's going to disrupt school time that's going to disrupt dinner some families can't afford it with gas all of that and so it's really like a beautiful thing to come together and you know you don't necessarily have to have so many on your team to be able to have a team right and so i would say is that worked for that community right and it actually sparked clama to do the same thing and now they had 30 and it sparked the community of Orleans to be a satellite from that downriver team. And that had another 15. So up and down the Klamath River, all of a sudden, you had all these little native wrestlers, mostly native wrestlers, along the, the Yurok Reservation. And it's truly beautiful because there's a lot of correlation between wrestling and our tra traditional game of sticks, too. And actually, after the first year of that, wrestling team being formed, the now vice chair had a sticks tournament, which is our traditional game during that summer on the river bar and, and witch pack. So I think that was just one example 
as far as what the community wanted and being able to offer that to them and them taking hold of it and running with it. I There was also a group of gentlemen who created their own talking circle and um, having sweats and creating their own like sweat lodge. And they did that every other week. And they were very um, adamant to not be associated with our healthcare clinic or the tribe. They wanted to do it on their own. Said, you know what, if you wanna do that, how can I support you? They needed tarps. I said, you know what, if you want your tarps, I'm gonna give you a QPR training and I'll, I'll give you your tarps because I want you to get some training. And they did that. And so just being able to, to feed, I would say some grassroots of what they wanted and not to be, you know, force feed them something that's not gonna work for them. And so there is a couple years later, they, they actually had a eight year old boy and a girl that was a couple years older and they went to Fresno, which again is about 10 hours away and they both become state champions. And so that is just really incredible as far as for that little community of only a couple hundred. And of course the community pride and just um, being proud of you know, the youth in their community, which I, I think is really incredible. Long story, I apologize for that, but it's been, you know, really impactful. And I will say, as far as in that community that, you know, to my knowledge, there hasn't been suicides after that cluster of seven and 17 months. And now we're going for, you know, a handful of years now. Thank you, Rob. I think that's just amazing. And, you know, just in case we have anyone in our audience who's unfamiliar with Humboldt County, you know, Rob mentioned Wichipec is, you know, it's it's very far out there, you know, in the woods and the mountains. Um, the part of Humboldt County where I'm from is um, very rural. You know, most of us out there, we don't have cell phone service unless we, you know, park on one part of the road. Uh, we're hours and hours away from traditional services. So hearing about communities building those resources for themselves within their communities and um, having both, you know, a, a traditional infrastructure of support and then also a, a smaller and um, more specific level of support for rural communities, I think is just, you know, fascinating and so important. There is a phrase uh, or an acronym that we've heard a couple of times now, which is QPR. Um, and I think maybe I'll cue off to uh, Stan real quick to walk that out and tell our audience about what it is and how they can use it. Yeah, so QPR stands for Question, Persuade, Refer, and it's um, it's what's often referred to as a gatekeeper training, although I don't and many people in the field don't like that term, um, but it's really about educating people on what to look for. Just warning signs, uh, risk factors that might increase risk of suicide. But um, I'm actually a master trainer in QPR. When I do the trainings, you know, while I, I tell people, of course, I want them to walk away more informed, more educated. What I really want them to walk away with is being more comfortable and confident to trust their instincts, that uh, there's no cookie cutter for every one of us, how we're going to react when we're stressed or when we're thinking about suicide. Um, so to really just, you know, trust that if you're coming from a place of compassion and empathy, um, you're going to end up in the right place. So really wanting people to walk away more comfortable in that space to not only recognize signs of distress, whether or not they fit that list, but then to be able to be willing to have that conversation. I have a saying that goes, when we speak the name of the beast, it will retreat. You know, only by being willing to engage and talk about suicide, to allow for it to be a possibility in our lives or the lives of us, those around us. and while there's obviously a ton of value in those types of trainings to empower people to, you know, sit with folks and have that conversation, be willing to ask directly, are you thinking about suicide? I think the other part of the coin is something that I hope we get to sooner than later, which is, you know, really setting the table on a day-to-day -day basis. So we don't have to have this kind of whack-a-mole mentality of like, oh, I need to recognize risk and respond to it. How do we set the table every day so that if anyone in our lives is having thoughts of suicide, 
they know that we're one of those people that they can come to who's not going to panic, who's not going to freak out, not going to press the red button. Uh, so I think it's twofold. It's on one end, yeah, we need to do a better job being more comfortable and recognizing that risk and having that conversation. But also, if there was one takeaway for folks out there, um, you know, people oftentimes will say, well, when is the best time to talk to somebody about suicide or about maybe your mental, their mental health concerns? And while, of course, you know, crisis, but Alex alluded to this earlier, how do we have conversations long before the crisis? And so I always tell people when things are going well, you know, use this conversation we're having tonight to go check in with your friends and say, hey, I saw this thing. I just want to let you know that if you ever have those thoughts, I'm one of the people that you can come to. Or if there's anybody out there right now who's having thoughts of ending their life and not sure whether they should be here tomorrow, trust that there are people who want to be there for you and that you're not putting a burden on them. In fact, I think one of the greatest honors we can ever have in this life is to be asked to, to sit with somebody and hold their hand while they search for hope again. Thank you so much, Stan. I think that's uh, that's really true. If you have a young person in your life, take them for a long car ride. I, I really treasure my, my long car rides with my 16-year-old nephew where we get to talk about all this stuff. So um, the, these destigmatizing efforts, really saying the word and being able to talk to talk to people in your community about it are so important. I understand that it's a really common myth that people think that if you ask someone if they're having suicidal thoughts, it may uh, make things worse. And we understand that that's not the case. Um, so I really want to quickly talk to um, Gardner. Um, about your experience. Um, specifically, I want to ask, you know, what surprised you about our local mental health care system here when this issue affected your family? Well, I just have to say that engaging in sharing uh, with people that have the similar concerns, it's a support oriented group. And I just found it to be absolutely, oh my God, I, I don't know what I would do now. It was so helpful. I almost don't, I, I value it and recommend it to anyone uh, at all, because you actually get to share other people's experiences, you get to exchange, and you also you get to comfort and listen, you know, empathetic, active listening, then it actually helps emotionally to do that. Um, another thing that happens is that you can share experiences. For instance, um, many times uh, people with mental illness or children or family members are 5150 and they go into the system and uh, whether it's 5250 or 5350 it's only a matter of time before and most of the time they fall out of the realm of care and then they're either in my case uh, my son multiple times and it would get worse he would end up on the street uh, um, he wouldn't be engaged. And the other thing that I want to mention is during this process, there's a great deal of comorbidity in terms of not only physical conditions. I, I could talk all night about tooth decay, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of other problems, you know. Never mind uh, IVDA, IV drug abuse, that whole thing, not to mention the drug epidemic and the fact that we have this, um, what we used to call, I'm a real old guy, uh, the underground culture. Um, you know, and that's how a lot of people survive wheeling and dealing, drugs, living on the street. And uh, it just, uh, heartbreaking. And through NAMI, uh, I want to say, I am really thankful 
not only for NAMI, but for um, being able to craft and communicate, in my case, for my son, uh, a way out, who is now in a residential active dual diagnosis active treatment program with the Veterans Administration. And it took a long time, it took three years, there were all kinds of things, but uh, not only NAMI, but being able to stay in touch with key players. And with an adult, there are a lot of obstacles about that. You know, there's confidentiality, there's uh, uh, legal, legal problems is another one that uh, comes up all the time, a, a court case, uh, advocating, being able to advocate effectively through the court system. And uh, oftentimes uh, a loved one or a parent cannot do that uh, legally. So it becomes another kind of an obstacle that can come up. But anyway, I, I will just end with, uh, I feel grateful and thankful and I, I really love NAMI, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Gardner. Thank you so much. And um, this might be a good time to talk, uh, Leah, just a little bit about NAMI, the services we have available in Humboldt and how people can get in touch with you guys. Oh, thanks, Linda, for giving me that opportunity. So NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness, is a nationwide program and it was started by two moms. It's a grassroots organization that started by a couple of moms that had kids with schizophrenia. And so our local chapter, NAMI Humboldt, has a website and um, we actually offer um, three support groups a week, two in Eureka, one in Redway, um, and folks can easily email me. It's just my name at yahoo.com. And, and I can send you the Zoom link and the information about them. Um, they are, I think sharing your lived experience with others not only helps other people, but it's like a way you can give back. Well, in my experience, here's what I did. And I learn stuff all the time. I learn all kinds of things. Did you know that DMV will buy back used vehicles for $1,000 or 1,500 bucks? DMV has a program to get old cars off the road. I didn't know that. I found that out last week. But in addition to our support groups, NAMI Humboldt offers a series of eight classes called Family to Family. Um, Bet Betsy and I were the first two folks that brought that program to Humboldt County. We camped out in Willits at the campground to get a training because nobody had any money back then. But anyway, the training is eight weeks long. It's called Family to Family. We will offer it again hopefully in the spring, and we try to do it at least twice a year. And it's free, it's open to the community, it's for family members and caregivers to learn about. I mean, you end up with a binder of information about brain biology, medications, communication. One whole class is on self-care because we, as family members with lived experience, and also if you've lost a family member to suicide, we have PTSD, whether you recognize it or not, all these experiences um, can have an effect on our stress level, on how we react to things. And so self-care is super important. I, I can't stress enough, if you don't keep, take care of yourself, you're not gonna be able to help other people. It's like in the airplane, they tell you to put on your, your air vent, mask first and then help a kid next to you or somebody else. So I think that's important for us uh, as family members and, and just, you know, in our culture right now to, um, to really take care of ourselves and our mental health as well. But yeah, thanks for the opportunity. NAMI is, is alive and well. We have a board. Um, we're always looking for more NAMI members. You can join, just get on the website, uh, NAMI Humboldt, and you can join on the website. So thanks, Linda, for my little plug. Thank you, Leah. Um, I just want to tell you guys some things that people in the audience are saying. Um, lots of kudos for uh, Rob and for Alex. Uh, Tricia says, promising news with all Rob, and you're doing way out there to build community and self-worth. 
Claire mentions asking directly if someone is thinking of killing themselves is so important. Research shows it does not increase someone's risk of suicide. And on that note, I'd like to ask Stan really quickly to touch on how do we know that someone might be having suicidal ideations and how do we have that conversation? Sure thing. Well, obviously we're gonna keep this short. Um, so I would encourage everyone to go to a QPR training, attend a training or, or visit a website to learn more. But I alluded to this earlier, the most important thing is to trust your instincts and allow for suicide to be a possibility in other people's lives. Um, we, what we typically think of withdrawal, isolation, changes in mood. Of course, those are there, but we have to broaden the horizon as well, realizing that not everybody knows how to process that pain. You know, when we think of someone who's having thoughts of suicide, we often think of the person who's over in the corner crying or who's pulled back and isolated. It can be that person, uh, but many people don't know how to process that pain show, so shows up as anger or aggression or reckless behavior. But when people act in that way, oftentimes our instinct is to push that person away. So really what we're looking for is any change in behavior. Again, allowing suicide to be a possibility. Um, and again, trusting your instincts. If something doesn't feel right, it's probably not right. And as you just mentioned, asking the question about suicide is not going to plant the seed. It's not going to put their, the idea in somebody's head. But also, we can't just look for warning signs. Um, you know, there's something called the cultural theory and model of suicide that talks about idioms of distress. And what we often have referred to as this kind of cookie cutter list of warning signs may vary upon different cultures or may vary upon individuals. And so some folks may not show any warning signs. They may wear that mask and be very stoic. And so just being connected and knowing about risk factors, if you think about kind of like the board game Jenga, there's all these blocks that are stacked up and when it comes to suicide, we often blame that one last block that gets pulled out. And there's a lot of other things typically going on. And that was really just the, the straw that broke the camel's back. So I think in addition to being aware of the warning signs, being connected. And uh, you've spoken previously about the, the Native communities that you have up in your area. And within the Native community, I think there, you know, something at the essence of it about connectedness um, really speaks to this part of it. But we have to be connected to know when those life events are occurring, because no matter how strong and stable any of us are, if you pull out enough blocks in our lives, we we all are going to stumble. So I think it's about being educated, looking for those warning signs, but also trusting your instincts and perhaps most importantly, being connected to know when those changes are happening. And it all comes down to being willing to have that conversation, not worrying about saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. Um, there's an old saying that says we have two ears and one mouth so that we can listen twice as much as we speak and just Hearing somebody's pain oftentimes can make them uh, safe and knowing where to go. And I'm sure we'll talk. I know we mentioned the 988 number um, and there's a lot of other resources out there where you can call, not just if you're in crisis, if you're having a bad day, or if you're worried about somebody, you need a little bit of coaching up on how to have that conversation. You can reach out to them as well. Thank you. And Rob, um, could you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, I'll just quickly say is that I've provided trainings to my community and my organization, and we've seen the list of, you know, what to look for. And I could leave that room and immediately forget everything on that list. And so when we look at that list, I go, what, what is common here? And we look at it and try to look at a theme. And generally, the theme is loss of something important to them right? So loss of relationship or loss of financial status or loss of freedom. There's so many things where we could, you know, loss of our health. And so, you know, if people are experiencing something, a loss of, and it's whatever that person values, and I think that deserves exploration and how they're handling those situations. Because it could be really overwhelming to remember something that you may have been exposed to once in the training. Thank you so much. We're having a lot of great um, comments from our audience. Um, I did want to go back to Alex really quickly. Alex, um, you offer peer-to-peer -peer support groups. And uh, could you just give a quick plug for that here in Humboldt County and tell people a little more about that? Yeah, totally. So I facilitate alternatives to suicide peer support groups. And when I say peer support, what that means is that I'm not a clinician. 
and I'm not able to assume on your behalf what your story is, um, but we all together hold the space. So every Monday from 6 to 7.30 p.m., we sit down on Zoom um, and we just hold the space open for anyone to talk and for people to support each other. So you're welcome to come, like show up, just vent about everything you're going through and then leave. You're also welcome to show up and just sit in silence just for the sake of being with other human beings. It's really about just being able to show up and be honest about where you're at. Um, a lot of people who come to our group in particular are people who have received help for um, feeling suicidal before, but they've had traumatic experiences with the mental health care systems. So they had experiences um, with law enforcement, with being locked up, with being coerced to take medications they don't want. And so the goal of our group is really to hold a space for those people who are afraid of talking about suicide in these um, spaces to show up and just be totally open and honest without being worried about those consequences or being worried about their autonomy being taken away. So yeah, that's what our group is. That's great. So we are going to just address a couple more audience questions and uh, then we're going to wrap up. So we have a couple of questions here. I did uh, pitch this one to Leah. I don't know if she had an answer for me. Um, but she is kind of an expert on this. She wanted to know, um, Linda Goff Evans asked, are there any studies about suicides within families? Two friends of mine each had family members who committed suicide. So as we know, um, there is a genetic component to suicide. And if you have relatives that have um, taken their lives um, it's something that you really need to be aware of, um, especially when you're, you know, raising your kids and with your own family members. Um, so it can be, uh, you know, a real kind of a warning sign. It's just like any other diabetes or, or any other, um, you know, cancer in your family. I think it's important that you know your genetic history for physical and mental illness, for, for that matter. Um, there is a book by Kay Redfield Jameson. She's a psychiatrist and she wrote a book called Touched by Fire. And it is a whole study uh, of suicide and, and suicide in families. And the, she links the creative gene of bipolar disorder and mental illness with, you know, Edgar Allan Poe, Schubert, Van Gogh, you know, about all, you know, Mozart, a lot of famous people. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's really important to be aware of if, if you have that ideation in your in your gene pool. Does that kind of answer it? Yes. And um, I would encourage anyone who has more questions to get in touch with Leah at, at NAMI Humble. Uh, we are going to link to some of the resources available um, via our uh, social media and, and other um, other sources. Um, my producer is reminding me that we actually have a big event coming up next week. It is the premiere of our documentary about suicide prevention in Humboldt County. Uh, that'll be at the Jefferson Community Center next Wednesday, the 16th. It starts at 7. I hope to see everybody there. Leah will be in that. Um, and we did have a question about groups for suicide survivors, family members. Um, Rob, I know that you have an event coming up on the 19th that's uh, specifically on that topic. Is that right? Yes. So it's International Survivors of Suicide Loss Day, and that's through the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. So United Indian Health Services is just hosting the space for our community, for those who want to attend. That is going to be November 19th at 10 a.m. And we're located near Mad River Hospital at 1600 Wiat Way. And that will be facilitated by Dr. Gina Belton. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, we also have, um, Again, resources through NAMI, resources through Transition Age Youth. I encourage everyone to check out Stan's uh, YouTube videos and some of his other work. And um, I wanna thank all of our panelists for being here tonight. Um, I really appreciate you sharing your Thursday evening with me and sharing so much strength and, and hope and information. So uh, to you and to our audience, uh, I wish everybody a, a lovely night.